Are we about the same level, do you reckon? Um, probably, that I can't judge it that well because I'm right next to it. Probably. I think we're all right. No, you're yeah. definitely louder than me, but it doesn't matter. Okay, good. So, uh, are we starting? Yeah, yeah, let's Have start. Have we started? Um, probably not yet, I mean... All right. So, oh, we're starting now. Yeah, let's start now. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, I'd like to start with your name. My name, well, for the purposes of this exhibition, my name is Heckles Horse Junior, but um, I'm AKA Edgeworth Johnston. Right, so shall I call you AKA or Heckle? I think Edgeworth or, or whatever, or Paul, because a lot of people know me as Paul. Paul. Um, so whatever you're comfortable calling me. I'm completely lost, but never mind, I'll stay Paul. Okay, Paul. So yeah. we are here at an exhibition. Mm. In, is there a name for this gallery? Black Ivory Printmaking and Audio Club. Right, and do you want to say anything about the gallery, the situation, before we get on to the paintings? Yeah, sure. Um, this room, until quite recently, was white. You probably remember it as being painted white. And I decided to paint it black. And as I was painting it black, it occurred to me that it, it took on quite a nice atmosphere. And it reminded me, for some reason, of the stuff is a manifesto. So I decided that it would be a good idea to host a load of um, exhibitions here. Um, the first of which was a, a general stuckish show. Actually, I don't know at what point I thought to do multiple shows. I think it's actually after the stuckish show. I thought I should start doing solo shows, and I've got a, a load of your work. So you were the first solo. And then I thought, well, there's no limits because it doesn't cost anything to do. So we can just do as many shows as we like of stuckism. Um, and look, again, it all started off from just painting the walls black and just that this, it took on quite a na nice atmosphere. Yeah. If you move the uh, microphone away because it's obscuring your face. Oh, right, yeah. So maybe if you put it down to the side. One, two. Oops. One, two. And we can see the, the mouth move. That's it, that's great. Mm. See the mouth moving. Yeah. Hey, put it back again in front of them. <laughs> You've got an addiction. You, it's like you've got an elastic band to the sponge. I think it's like I sing into this, so I'm so yeah. used to singing. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just nice to see the face. That's mm. cool. So we've, we've got a gallery. And um, no, I must say, I think this is great because people I've heard over the years often say, oh, we can't get a show. And I say, well, you've got a flat, haven't you? You've got a house, you've got a bedroom, you know, mm. you've got a gallery. Yeah. And in fact, that when I first started out, I did three print shows in America. Mm. Um, at various galleries in New York and Los Angeles, because I knew people and they kindly renamed their living quarters a gallery for a week and had some of my prints yeah. there. So, um, well, if you, you, you slip back again. Oh, sorry. Can I can I keep on reminding you? Yeah, sure. It's do, a yeah. bit annoying, is it? No. Nice. So we've got the gallery, which is an example to everybody in the world, it's especially people that can't get a gallery exhibition. Is that well? You'll do a better job of it yourself anyway. They say if you want something done properly, do it yourself. That's what my mother oh, used to say. Did you know my mother? <laughs> <laughs> I spoke to your dad once, oh. very briefly, but not your mother. Yeah, that's what. It's funny because your dad thought I was. Seb, I think. <laughs> That's my I, son. Yeah. Um, so for some reason, I picked up your phone in your house. I, oh. I, I don't know how it happened, but but no, it's um. Sorry. <laughs> the uh, the if it's you want still, something. Still, still, still sorry. Right it's just on. Right. That's it. That's lovely. Oh, okay. If um. I'm the director. It's funny that the 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 if you want something done properly, do it yourself thing, because um. This is sort of my way of showing the heckle's horse work is to just do them myself and then I can show them. You okay, know. and this segue is neatly into heckle's horse. Yes. Which is, well, shall we say who heckle is to start with? Eric Heckel, uh, one of the German expressionists who, um, Billy in particular, I, I mean, I like heckle as well, but Billy, I think, is a big fan of his. I should Notice say. Notice to the audience, Billy is Billy Childish, who we will come on to in a moment. Yeah. And, um... We started some group a few years ago, well actually 2014-15, and I think Billy came up with the name Heckle's Horse for this group. 
but at the time billy and i were painting all these paintings together which we just called childish edgeworth because that was us and then steve who works with billy came up with the idea of calling our partnership heckles horse why horse it i think it refers to a picture that eric heckle did that i think billy's particularly keen on yeah I, I, to be honest i don't know i'm just guessing yeah you mentioned german expressionism i mean um eric heckle was a member of die Brucke group which was founded about 1905 mm -hmm. absolutely kirchner was a leading light of it and it packed up after I don't know, five years or so from disputes um, but there was another german expressionist group at the beginning of the 20th century called the blue rider Mm. which people might confuse with Heckel's Horse. They might think the rider was on Heckel's Horse, but that's nothing to do with it. <laughs> no, no, no as far as I'm aware. Yeah. And I um, should say, for the audience who don't know, Billy, being Billy Childish, is um, known for various things, uh, particularly his music, and he's been name-checked by quite a lot of famous people, including that guy with the white stripes, mm. and um, Bjork, is it? And, uh, Various. Uh, yeah, I don't know about Bjork, but there are a few, yeah. I mean... Um, yeah, a number of different people, quite well known. But he's also an artist, poet, writer. Um, he's probably best known as Tracy Emin's ex-boyfriend, if the truth be told, which is uh, unfair because he's got a lot more mm. achievements than that. Um, mm. And actually, the fact that she once said to him, you're paintings are stuck, 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 because he was painting and she'd exhibited her bed, or she was, hadn't done it by then, but the sort of thing she was into. And he wrote that in a poem, and then in 1999 he read the poem to me, and I said we should call ourselves Stuckist, and then the Stuckist art group was founded mm. to promote figurative painting. That was 1999, and uh, you had founded a Stuckist group. There's about uh, 250 Stuckist groups in 50 countries around the world. Steve is a guy who runs the L13 Gallery in um, yeah, Clerkenwell, Farringdon area, yeah, of yeah. London. And the L13 was named after a German Zeppelin bomber which destroyed um, some property in that area. I think the gallery was next door to the destroyed property. Anyway, that's where L13 comes from, but it's moved from that place. And they've worked together around Steve at L13, promotes Billy's work. Um, he also does stuff himself, doesn't he? What's he called? Harry Adams. Harry Adams. Him and he, another guy, also Harry Adams. also does uh, Jimmy Corty of the K Foundation, who's earned a million pounds, and Jamie Reed, who did the Sex Pistols, never mind the Bollocks album. So that's all the background, which I didn't really want to say, but <laughs> anyway. Maybe. It's good to know, it's good because I'll keep saying Steve, Billy, and nobody knows who yeah. they are. So you um, got to know them, mm. and you go down every Monday yep. and work with Billy in his gallery. Billy's gallery is a very large room that was in Chatham, that is in Chatham Dockyard. His studio we're talking about. Yeah, sorry, his yeah. studio. Just a gallery, did I? Yeah. 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 Uh, that's his studio, you work there, Billy does very large paintings. Huddy, Hamper as well, he's there every week. That's Billy's son. Yeah. And Billy does like 8 foot, 10 foot paintings in a couple of hours. Mm. Well, his... maybe not two, but uh, uh, in an afternoon he'll do a huge painting from yeah. start to finish. But these are, the ones he does are a very different style. Uh, one could say that he's become quite academic, uh, drawn accurately in terms of like, perspective and anatomy and so on. Um, and they sell very well in galleries in Germany and New York. But alongside those paintings, there is another activity going on, which he does with you. Would you like to tell us how that activity started and how it happens when you're there together? It started, um, well, shall I start from the point where I was already in his gallery painting, you know, because... Were you? I... Yeah, well... I can start from when I first sort of got in touch with him, or shall I just yeah, start? Yeah, start from the okay. beginning. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Now I've got to try and remember how it happened. Uh, well, you went to about the thirteen, the gallery, and saw his shows and talked to him there, I presume. Uh, well, maybe a couple of words. I might just say I, well, it was I, I until he emailed me out the blue one day. I said hardly anything to him. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I've met him a couple of times at um, L thirteen, but. Um, I, I, he just emailed me, and um, I think you had 
you'd said to me that you speak on the phone every now and then to billy and you mentioned me when you'd had a few so i guess he heard of me probably through you i don't know yeah i should say i've known billy since about nineteen seventy nine and we were in a group called the medway poets and tracy and was a young fashion student and she was going out with billy so yeah we have had our ups and downs and now but we've um got on reasonably well for the last 20 years or so mm. so yeah so yeah, so I, f I, I guess he probably heard of me through you and then he emailed me and I just got into an email to, talking to him through email, having not really ever spoken to him before other than small talk at an uh, exhibition. And he said, oh, he should come down one day. Oh, that was it. He wanted, he wanted to see my paintings because I was showing him my work. And he said, oh, you should bring them down one day. So I did and he saw them and we had a chat and then... He said, is it quite a bother for you coming down here? He said one day. I said, well, it's quite easy because I had a car at the time. I said, I can drive to Chatham in three quarters of an hour. And uh, he goes, oh, you should come down to the studio one day. So I went down to the studio and I was working. And he says, you know what you should do? You should get some big canvases because he thought it'd be better for my work. And this is funny because Billy didn't know me and he just offered, he's very, he's very kind of charitable. So he's helping me out a ton. And he says, you should, bring, you should get a load of canvases and we'll put you up in my studio and give you a load of space. And because I think if you work bigger, it would, it would work. It'd be better for your, your style of painting or whatever. Because I was always working small because of my living situation. So I did that. But I think before I got the canvases, I just turned up a load of cardboard. And I was doing a, a painting on cardboard. There was a copy of a block print I'd done of um, is a portrait of Picasso, and it had a couple of birds on it, sort of pecking his eyes out and stuff like that. And he goes, "Oh, that's all right," but um, he, he said, "Can I?" <sighs> did he ask you? I don't know. I think he probably did. He said, like, "It wouldn't be good if you had a couple of lines." So I had like three or four of these Picassos. So they weren't particularly precious or anything. They were all on cardboard, and. Um, he painted some eyes or a few white lines on them and it looked a lot better and he goes okay well that, that's quite good so then i started painting on these great big canvases like six foot canvases and again the same thing happened billy because it was very much kind of trying to I mean, billy was kind of helping me sort of get into a different area of painting so he'd paint on them and the first one we did on canvas that looked really good as well so he goes, you know, we should do a ton of, well, he didn't say do a ton, of, we should do more of these. And we ended up just continually doing more and more and more because they're so easy. Because they're easy for me because I can just start and I don't even have to bother making them look good. I just need to leave them in a good state for Billy. So I, I painted and he'd come over and he'd do it. And, and it, it was just so automatic and so sort of natural. And they had a kind of look to them that neither mine nor his works do. They are their own thing. Um, and, it, and it kind of snowballed and uh, yeah, 10 years, nine years later, we're still, although we, to be honest, since COVID, we've only done a couple, we've slowed right down recently. But, but how many do you think you've done all together? I reckon between 150 and 200. Um, so, so you usually do one each visit, do you? Well, not, not anymore, no. Like I say, since COVID. Or when I, you were working at your when, peak? At, at our peak. Um, Probably one a week, mm -hmm. probably averaged one a week. Okay, um, and you've exhibited these at the Pushkin House. What is the Pushkin House and where is that? Yeah, we've done that. We, that was a group show. It's the Pushkin House is um, it's in central London and it's some centre for Russian culture. I don't know exactly what their sort of description is. But we, I don't, again, I don't know how this show... It's not called Putin House. Yeah. Um, anyway, sorry. That's all right. Hey, we'll delete that. <laughs> no, 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 no. We'll just do the whole thing. Um, what was I saying? Pushkin House. I don't know how that show came up. Because I, Billy and Steve tend to do all the organising side of yeah. things and I hear about it well, later. Yeah, I, I just want to make the point that you have shown them there. We've it's done lovely. three. Yeah, we've done three. We've been in three group shows. One was Pushkin House. That was sort of like the, the most prestigious of the three. We did one at Sunpier House. Now that's Chatham in, in Kent. Yeah. Near Billy's studio. Yeah. yeah. And um, I can't remember. I'm sure, oh, uh, Russia. Um, there was some show in Russia. Um, 
where they showed some heckles horse. Well, I don't think we were called heckles horse at that point, but mm-hmm. some of them were showed over there. And, yeah. But I don't know how. All I know about that, I looked on YouTube one day and I saw my paintings being auctioned off and no one told me they were selling them. This is the joint painting, is it? No, no, these are one, these are oil transfer drawings I did and um, I just saw on YouTube that my paintings are being sold. Okay. This is interesting. If you, if you want to move a little bit again. Um, oh, sorry. Does, does it matter yeah. if we see your face? I mean, I think we should, personally, but yeah, we, might, I mean, we might be feeling a little bit bashful or something. No, I'm, o- I'm okay like this. I mean, shall I move forward? Yeah. yeah. Go for broke. <laughs> Um, there we are. It's just I, I just find it really annoying when there's interviews and singers and you can't see the whole of their face. It just seems like you know you're missing out really on some of the Okay. Interviews. Um so so far so good. Um now, these are not actually Heckles Hall's paintings. No, no they're, they're not, they're not. They're not. They are your uh Copies of oh sorry before I forget are these Heckles Hall's paintings for sale or are you keeping no. them privately or uh, keeping them I'm not I don't really want I've only done eight and I don't really want to no, sell no, not them. not these I mean talking about oh Billy's Billy, yeah um or they, 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 they're selling the shows or I don't know I mean just I for don't just know. for the, the viewers you know yeah I I have a few millionaires knocking around I mean they're not they're not sort of um. You can't buy them online or anything, and there's no gallery showing them. But I, if someone was to ask, I, I guess everything has a price. Sorry. I, I guess... <laughs> it's probably too far away. Now. That's all right. I guess that the Heckles Horse paintings... Yeah, far too far away. All right. One, two. One, two. Actually, do it from the side. Check, check, check. Yeah, check, I think check. that's the trick, is to do it at the side. Okay. Check, check, check. Right. So, okay. I seem to be louder than you. Okay. This is very amateur, by the way. You know, just in case anybody mm. here thinks this is a professional job with a whole camera crew, sound recording, mm. uh, overhead lighting, and, and so on, and a van outside with massive masses of wires trailing out of it. It's not... It's just one, one camera on a tripod. Actually, they probably guessed that by now, anyway. Yeah, I don't think we were fooling anyone. Um, no. We've we could got, pretend it's like a high-end thing meant to look like a low-end thing. The webcams also record. I'll do that one for backup in case that one doesn't work. So yeah. we've got two cameras. The webcam? Where, where is that? On top of the um, uh, monitor. Oh, right. And then the camcorder's also... It's just in case one of them doesn't work, I've got a backup. But. So just do a little quick detour before we get onto the paintings. Mm. A detour about the video here. Mm. Um, if this is a homemade show, mm-hmm. what about your videos? I mean, what's the philosophy of the videos? How do you do those? And what the... This is what we're doing now, for example. Well, I just film them and put them on YouTube and yeah. put them on social media. I mean, we've got an audience of like four people at the moment. So, um, that, so it's quadrupled since I last looked. Yeah, we've got That's one. That's bloody good, going up 400%. <laughs> well, I, it's, it's kind of um, in keeping with the whole atmosphere of what we're doing that we've got it's i mean it's um i can remember sorry to interrupt but billy once told me that he did a gig in he was in germany and there were mm. 10 people turned up and um they said look you know we don't expect you to play because you mm. don't have the proper audience and he said you're here you're the audience we're playing mm. and it turned out that one of them was an influential music journalist so, yeah. yeah yeah you never know i, I mean what well, does it matter with it I and mean, what's the difference between like having an audience of one and having an audience of Ten thousand or a million. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you add noughts on the end, I mean, mm. my experience of you know curating shows is that I do it because I enjoy seeing the painting, mm. which is probably a very selfish approach to it. But it means I don't get het up and frustrated about who's coming through the door and who isn't. Yeah. You know, if the people that are there enjoy it, mm. those four people really get something from yeah. it. Yeah. You don't know how it's going to affect their lives, and things tend to pick up later. I mean, just when Cubism started, there were only two people that knew about it. Mm, yeah. And Picasso and Braque, just mm. two people. Yeah. Well, it's kind of grown a bit since then. You so, never know, yeah. Um, everything is homemade. Yeah. Now, as I said, these are not Heckles Hall's paintings, these are fake Heckles, Heckles Hall's paintings. Mm. Not fake, perhaps, that's not the right word. Um, 
you have made your own copies of Heckel's Horse paintings. Mm. These are your copies of the work you did with Billy. Mm. Um, these are on cardboard. The ones you do with Billy are on canvas, aren't they? Well, linen, but yeah, stretched Belgian yeah. linen, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, no, some, some of them are actually on canvas, okay. but most of them aren't. For the uh, viewers who don't know the difference, um, it's all the same. <laughs> It just looks like a canvas stretch. One is made from cotton, the other is made from linen, but yeah. it don't make any bloody difference, does it really? Yeah. At the end of the day, except linen lasts longer than canvas. But the sales of Nelson's Victory lasted quite a long time. They're still there with lots mm. of uh, cannonball holes in them and stuff. All they, this, all they this found stuff. them the other day. Right. A couple of years or so, or three years ago. Whatever. Anyway, they've survived. Um, are the originals bigger? Yes, they are. How much bigger? Right, let's take this one for example. They're they're all. Um, that one's a six foot by five foot, I think. Right. So this is about what is it? Forty by thirty or something. Something, yeah. And it's a your reproduction of a six foot by five. Foot yeah, I, I guess. So quite a lot bigger. In fact, if it's six foot, it would be the size of me. So be up to there and across to there. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, what, quarter of the size? Why did you decide to do it this size? Just that's the, what, the, what the materials are that I have. Okay. I, I didn't need them to be big. Okay. Um, why did you do them? Lots of reasons. One, I suppose the one, the main thing is I like them and I can do them. And it's not that... I could do. I definitely couldn't do them without Billy. But I, I'm sort of quite. Oh, sorry, why did you do these? These particular ones. These copies. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So what I should say. I, I'm not trying to say I could do the main Heckles horse without Billy. When I say I'm quite interested to see what they look like when I just do them on my own. You know what I mean? But. Um, but also, I wanted to use this space as the show to do some sort of thing for Heckle's Horse because Heckle's Horse has despite Billy and I always wanting to do a show it's never really been possible and I thought well I've got Charles's show up here which I did at the time and I knew that That's Jack me, by the way. sorry Charles had a solo no, show here yeah. and the plan was for Jasmine I think to go next Jasmine Cerulius her paintings so, are down here actually. yeah Next to me. I need to keep. I keep calling it Jasmine, Jasmine Surreal, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Right. So Jasmine Surreal was lined up next, but I thought, well, I could take Charles's work down now and get mine in quickly because I've I've got you, Ron True, Emma Pugmire, and I was thinking, well, when am I going to do my show? Because I want to get mine done. So I thought, if I quickly took down yours, I could do an Edgeworth Johnston show. But then I thought, well. I've got no enthusiasm for doing an Edgeworth Johnson show because it's I just don't. But I thought what I would like to do is put up Heckle's horse paintings, but obviously I can't do that because they're not mine. They're me and Billy. So I thought well, if I do them myself, then I've got complete control and I can put them up and I can not only do an art show but I can promote Heckle's horse so more people learn about Heckle's horse and also for the artistic value in themselves, do hopefully do some decent paintings. So what's this exhibition called? Heckle, who, is it, who is it by? It's uh, it's called Heckles Horse Junior, and it is by Heckles Horse Junior. So self-titled exhibition. Okay, so let's just take this painting. Mm. I mean, I'm familiar with some of the originals. Um, so yeah, I mean, I recognise these are the types of paintings you've been doing, ones I've seen in Pushkin House, for example. Yeah. Um, but I'm not. You know, I don't know them in intimate detail, so I could be fooled because they kind of like it. So if I put the original next to this, what apart from the size, mm. what differences would I see? Not much. I mean, I, I have pretty much just copied them. Um, this one is a we did after a painting by Mikhail Larinov. We did quite a lot after Larinov, who's a, a Russian painter from a couple of hundred years ago. Um, early 20th century. <laughs> okay, sorry, early, yeah. He's, he's, most people might know his, I don't think he ever got married, but his partner, Natalia Goncharova, is quite well known. Um, yes, he was the highest selling female artist at auction, I think, at the moment. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. And he was a, a sort. He's Russian, but he's there's links with him and Picasso and that whole avant-garde crowd. Um, and uh, yeah, Billy and I did a load of paintings after Mikhail Larinov, and that this was the first Heckel's Horse painting. This is painted after the first Heckel's Horse painting we did of a Larinov painting. Um, that actually, that one is a that was so. Oh, sorry. You you talked about doing a Larionov painting. Have you sort of more or less copied a Larionov painting? No. The, in, the, in the style of or inspired by? Inspired by Larionov. So the the Heckel's horse paintings that were done after Larionov are not copies. They're just uh, we we use Larionov as a starting point, but the end result looks quite a lot different. Oh, I see. So the whole Heckel's horse project stemmed from Larionov's inspiration. No, we were already painting together before we started doing Larinov paintings. Oh, in the kind of same style? Pretty much. I mean, we were already... So he just got hijacked and incorporated into it en route and you moved on like a little bump in the road and you carried on going? And... It, it, well, we, weren't, we didn't stop, you know what I mean? Like we, we did them as well. So it's like instead of always doing a painting for maybe a sketch or maybe even just off the cuff, occasionally... Really, would have this Larinov book, and we'd go through it and pick out paintings that we liked. But it wasn't like we stopped doing Heckel's Horse and started doing something else. It wasn't like a a chunk of work in its own right. It was we just happened to do lots of Larinovs. Yeah, but it, it's not called Larinov's Lunger, is it? It's called Heckel's Horse. So, yeah. Um, have you done the same thing with Eric Heckel's work? Of your own variants of that? I think we have. I think we've done maybe two or three. The most common, the m more, more Larry and than anyone else, but we have done a couple of headquarters as well. Okay, but it seems that really these people are just a catalyst for you to do your own work. Yeah. 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 Okay. So if we get on to the paintings themselves, um, <laughs> The first thing that you will notice about them is there is a figurative element. There is kind of often there's a person or people, sometimes a horse, there's still a person there, and actually a horse and person there. I can't see that one, it doesn't matter you're in the way, but there's, there's a seems to be a person in, in all of them, the ones that are here. Yeah. Um, are we, is, is there, a, what I'm trying to say, is there a meaning, is there a narrative, a story, or is it just a visual? Is it just that it works visually, like you know, you have a dream and you see things going on, or are you actually thinking actually this is a particular soldier? Maybe it's Larry enough in uniform or something like that, or maybe he painted these Russian soldiers, so we're going to kind of comment on that, or maybe uh, Kirchner of the De Brucker Expressionist Group was a soldier for a time. Does, does that come into it, or is this me just? Put, yeah. projecting onto it things that I know. Am I meant to be doing this, or is there a story that I should know that you know? Um, or is it just a guy on a horse with a bit of a uniform? It's, it's, for, for, as far as I'm concerned, there, there's no real comment or meaning or re requirement to know anything. They're, they're standalone paintings that you don't need to have any background knowledge to do you appreciate. Have, do you have any? When you do it, do you think, oh yeah, this is reminding me of... Da -da -da no, no, no. I, all I'm trying to do when I'm painting is do a good painting. There's okay. no, there's no, nothing else. Okay, well I'm going to challenge you a little bit on that because mm. he is in a uniform, it's like a military uniform with a kind of... Yeah, color. yeah. Um, not obviously like a contemporary modern day soldier unless he's mm. dressed up in traditional uniform. Mm. So you must have got that reference from somebody, you know, it's not an accident, you can't just do someone in a uniform without knowing that people wore uniforms. No, well I, I'm just copying the painting and the, and the, no, the I'm guy... the original painting. Well, the Larionov, because no, no, that's, no. a, that's a painting, that's a cop, that's not a cop, it's a painting of a Heckel's Horse painting which was based on the Larionov. Ah, that's what I'm getting at. And in the Larionov painting, that's what the guy's wearing. Yeah, because so he knew he was painting a cavalryman. Um, Larionov would have done, yeah. yeah he definitely knew he was painting a particular soldier at that time in history. I presume it was just before First World War. I don't know, I don't know. Okay, yeah. so he knew what he was doing, but you're not really bothered with that side of it at all. Not really, no. Okay. 
I mean, not at all. I, I, I just like a, I like a painting to be a good painting. I don't really mind the um, the, the, the background story. Okay, I mean, one of the things that's said about figurative painting is that every figurative painting is an abstract painting. Mm. Um, and you're demonstrating that. Mm. You're looking, and we can can't see that one up behind you, can we, very well? This one. The one right up there. No, not, not uh, this one. I can pick another one. Actually, let's. Is that easy to take down? Easy, yeah. Yeah, let's take that down. It's hot. No, the one above. It's just, I think it. It's kind of vivid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we could hold it up here. Yeah. Oh, what about, we could stick it up. What about stick it down low? That you know what I can do? I can put a JPEG of it on the uh, yeah. screen. Okay. That's. Well, that, that, that will do the trick, because I think um, you can see there that a lot of the cardboard or the original canvas is not painted on, but there's enough there to define things, but it's got a very abstract quality. Let's try an experiment, let's turn it upside down. Yeah, I'll let go next. Or sideways or anything. By the way, the paint sweats, so be careful. <laughs> no, <it doesn't. laughs> yeah. I won't pick my nose. Right, if we can get that. Right. Okay, so the reason I've done that, I, I got it from somebody. It was, um, oh dear, what's his name? What's the chap who did the first? Um, Kandinsky. Oh, yeah, the abstract guy, yeah. Well, he was doing these figurative paintings, and he mm. came in one day and he saw this painting propped up with the most amazing colours. Mm. Completely abstract. Mm. And then he realised it was one of his paint, figurative paintings of a landscape or something, but that gave him the idea that you could just paint abstract without having to have a figurative work, figurative image. Mm. And when you look at things in different ways, like, let's try it sideways, should we try it sideways as well? I mean, it works without even having to know there's an image. Mm. Um, rather like, I don't know, um, Chinese calligraphy type paintings, yeah. where someone will do beautiful brush marks all over the surface. Yeah. Um, and it's that movement, that gesture that the brush makes, which gives it the interest. And anybody that's done something like that will know that you can do that brush mark and it can be very dull and mm. prosaic, or you can do it and the variation, the pressure, and the, the, the dynamic, the direction it's going in, the flow of the ink and so on, comes alive. Mm. So I think it's not just a question of painting the subject, it's like, it's really how you paint it. And I think how you paint it comes from who you are. And mm. I've talked about this quite a lot. And before you have any art, you have an artist, and they are going to leave their stamp on the painting. They can't help it. Mm. You know, if someone is a superficial person, they're not suddenly going to find an amazing depth when they paint the painting. If they do, then they're touching a deeper part of themselves anyway. But if they never access that deeper part of themselves, and unless it does come out despite themselves, if you like, mm. then so their work can be superficial. Mm. So every mark, every colour, every decision. I mean, conceptual art has very few decisions. I mean, Damien Hurst's shark has one decision. I will get a shark and I will put it in full moon high. That's the decision. Mm. Whereas taking any of these paintings, every square inch has got a different decision on it. Mm. You've got to do this mark here, this colour. There's a red here, which is slightly different from the red there. Yeah. Um, this band is a similar colour to those that mark that's a sort of almost a rectangle of paint mm. this is a rectangle but it's a very a bit of a wonky one but it's a different kind of rectangle yeah um and i'm going on a bit here you mentioned jasmine surreal i did a big painting once it was, uh, it was a 10 foot painting i've only done one that size so i so wanted to get to get out of the living room but it's got agitated brush marks all over it from colours, different mm. intensities. And she, she would look at it and said, you were feeling like more passion or anger there, and then you were feeling quiet. I said, yeah, you're right. Mm. She could read 
the marks and the colours as if they were words. Yeah. And basically they are. It's we're talking a language. It's not one that our society, our culture is particularly skilled at reading. Mm. You know, we're taught to read words, but people are generally not taught to read images. Mm. Obviously sometimes they do it instinctively and they look at something and say, Well that's gloomy, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I've read the colour, the shape, or they mm. might say it's a bit bright. Mm. You know, the intensity is, is blinding. So there is a primitive reading, but not a very su subtle and sophisticated one. And it's like wine, you know, you start out with Libra milk or something, and it's like a sweet wine. And, you know, 10 years later, you sort of turn your nose up at it because you've developed a palate. And it's like anything, you know, the more you do it, I mean, using words, for example, mm. you don't expect a five-year-old to have the expressive capability of Shakespeare. Um, it's something you develop and become more sophisticated, more sensitive to, hopefully, if it's going in the right direction. Mm. So what I'm saying is, in these paintings, there is a display of a lot of what I'm talking about, a feeling for the right colour, the right shape, and the right place. Yeah. Um, now, to my mind, there's a balance between what you're painting and how you're painting it. In abstract work, work, obviously, it's completely how you're doing it, mm. because you're not painting any specific subject. And I think the interesting thing about figurative work is that tension between what it's showing and how it's showing it. Do you have any response to all of that? Yeah, well, all, I mean, I don't think people that look at paintings are aware of how much you're considering as you're doing them, especially with my work which can look quite sloppy and I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm talking for millions of other painters who th there's a very deliberate move in everything you're doing that's totally beyond the concept. I mean, I know you started from saying Damien Hirst's conceptual work is always oh, a concept. Well, I mean, who cares about the concept? I mean, the con you can start off with that, all right, fine, but the, what I like in art all, all comes from that point onwards. And um, just the satisfaction you get of, of seeing things that look kind of balanced and correct in an abstract sense, but I could never, it would have to be ground, have to be attached to something figurative for it to have any kind of hold on me. I, I, I couldn't care less about abstract work at all. I mean, it has, it has to relate to something that's phys in physical existence, otherwise it just goes over my head. Um, and I think there's a balance there. I, I, I'm trying to maybe do as much abstract work as I can in a figurative painting as possible and having nothing else at all, like not having any concept or meaning or narrative or any... If you take all that stuff out, you're left, I think, with a more sort of pure thing at the end of it. Um, as soon as you do anything figurative, you've got a narrative whether you want it or not. Yeah, and then if you if if you just leave it as as to what looks good. I mean, I'm I'm always just trying to do stuff that just looks good. There's not really any kind of emotion in it or any kind of um it, it need to express myself. I'm I'm really just trying to do something that looks good and something that. I don't know. It's, it's hard to explain, but um. Well, at the end of the day. Of I mean, I particularly apply this to poetry, which I write a lot, which I'm doing at the moment. At the end of the day, what's left is the poem, and someone reads that, and that's got to work. The poem has got to work. Mm. Um, so I might write about my life in the poem, um, and there might be something that is particular to my life, but it doesn't sort of sit in the poem. Because I think when you're creating something, there's a dialogue between you and the thing you're creating, and it's telling you what to do. Mm. I mean, I, I, this has happened to me quite a lot with painting. Like, for example, I thought, all right, I've got a red there, I'm just speaking in general terms, crude terms, a red there, a green there, and I'll put a nice yellow there. So I put the red there, and as soon as I've done that, I realise the green is not going to work. Mm. And the painting is saying, hang on, you know, this was your bright idea, but look at it, yeah. it's not going to work, is it? Actually, you need the yellow there. Mm. And then like, oh, and then we need a blue up there, and then later on the colour that I had left out pops up down here. So it's mm. kind of not lost, it sort of comes up again quite often in a different form. So there's that interaction. At the end of the day, you're, you've got 
you're creating something, you're making something, and if you are sharing it, then I think you have to consider who's looking at it, whether you do that consciously or unconsciously. Otherwise, you know, what's what's the point of showing it? You're not just you're not creating something that someone can look at and get something from. There's no point in showing it to them. Well, no, but I could quite happily just do. It. I mean, I, I feel like I don't really have a choice when I'm painting. You know, it. It's, you, if you go with your gut and just say, okay, this, it's almost like it needs to be that and it can't be anything else. So I can't even consider, oh, well, if someone else sees it, they more like it, so I need to try and do this or try. And, I'm, I'm really just sort of um, at the mercy of what feels like the right thing to do, and I can't really do anything else. So I think we are actually saying the same thing. Right, okay, cool. Um, I'm not saying you should adjust everything for someone to look at it, because actually I, that happens to me. Mm. I sometimes have an idea and I think, oh, I'm going to do this painting, and oh, it's just too easy, it's not too simple, people are going to think it's rubbish, I don't want to do it. But I really want to do it, mm. and people are going to think it's rubbish, and I, so I just do it, and they come along and think they really like it. Mm. <laughs> and that's just me, because... I suppose I have a sort of awareness of what's going on outside me, you know. But you're you're doing you're doing what feels like the right thing to do anyway. Yeah, but sometimes there's a, a block. Yeah. Less so nowadays, I must say. Mm. But in the past, more so. Yeah. Uh, you don't have that. But you you have talked about doing what's right on mm. the on the canvas. Mm. And that's exactly what I'm saying. That it is telling you something. It is, yeah. yeah. And I, I, I was even thinking this, what was it, Monday, or today, today, Wednesday, uh, two days ago, it, I was doing a painting of a fish under a boat, and um, I mean, I, 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 I realised that I don't really have any choice, this is going to be a fish under a boat, because if I know if I, if I come in with my bright idea, it's, it's going to totally screw it up, so I, you, you're just sort of following orders, really. Yeah, I mean, the one that um, we pulled down from the wall and showed in front of the camera, I mean, I'm facing that, so it's the one that's easiest for me to look at, and there's a man, he seems to be wearing a hat, and there's a, an animal of some kind, I'm not very good on animals, is it a, a pig of some kind? Yeah, I think it's a dog, I think. A dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pigs don't normally have pointed noses, but then mm. neither do dogs unless they're pointers. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know much about dogs. Um, but I get a feeling from it. Um, it's not unpleasant. Um, I think just a few lines can be very suggestive. So the man's face, there seems to be a certain thoughtful quality to it. Um, he seems to have stopped and, and be thinking about something. And that's something that everybody can relate to. And the animals there, well again, you can relate to that. The animal sort of seems to be you know, absorbed in its own life, sort of mooching around the ground, sniffing the ground. Um, the man seems aware of it, but not really that relevant to him at this, that point in time. Um, and he's in front of a building, looks like his house, so you think that's probably his home, and maybe it's his garden, that sort of thing. You get a feeling for the whole thing. Um, but that could be done in a very illustrative kind of way, like a Norman Rockwell or something, and you wouldn't get the same feeling from it, though. You wouldn't get the same atmosphere. And the whole sort of sketchy thing suggests a liveliness, you know, what well, conveys a liveliness, um, a sort of spontaneity. Yeah, I mean, which I... makes it living. Yeah. Whereas a Rockwell, very skilled mm -hmm. illustration. It's kind of frozen in time. Um, but it's as, it's as different to what, what I'm doing as, as, you know, making cheese, you know, or playing football. I mean, I know that technically they are both called paintings, but other than that, there's nothing. I think there's a lot of, I mean, art's such an over, overriding term, but so is figurative painting. I mean, there's figurative painters that, that I just think are... are but they're, they're not doing what I'm doing at all, and that's not necessarily a good or bad thing. But even within stuckism, there's there's painters, I know like Jonathan Cadrill, for example, I mean, I, he's absolutely brilliant at what he does, but I, I don't really see, like me and him, for example, as we, I don't think, 
I don't, I don't know what's going on inside his head, but I, I, I just see it as being something just completely different. But you have been exhibited more or less side by side. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, the suckism is a very suckism, you know, the art group, which mm. was mentioned earlier, which I had the idea of, and co-founded with Billy Childish to promote figurative painting. Um, but my idea of it from the outset was a very big umbrella. Mm. So you'd have very expressionist work, very highly polished work, cubism, pop art, figurative work, um, pop art, um, realist art, all different kinds um, of style. It wasn't a stylistic thing. What mm. was important was that the artist was had a strong sense of authenticity, of honesty to themselves and their experience of life and had the skill to communicate that in their own style and really modernism is the history of people inventing their own rules and their own styles I mean Van Gogh invented his own rules which was that things could be wonky and distorted and would be painted in uh, very agitated you know often swirling brush marks to express all the energy he felt in the universe um, whereas another artist, obviously Picasso, for example, chose to fracture things. Um, he didn't, in his Cubist period, have the same, well, he had some of the same brush marks, but not for the same effect at all. I mean, it was more or less fractured planes. He was interested in sort of dissecting something and putting it back together again. Different, but it worked in his terms. If you look at any of the modernist artists whose work is successful, and they've invented their own domain to work in. That's, that's modernism, and then we come on to postmodernism where people plunder it, or remodernism where we value it and try and develop it. I think with, I mean, any any good art is, I think, that what um, has to be, any good art is just authentic. And I mean, Picasso, not Picasso, Van Gogh said, anything done in love is done well. And I think that that's basically it. I mean, I, I read the Stuckist Manifesto and I think, well, that's how I write songs. That's how I, whenever I'm doing anything, it is just that that um, feeling of authenticity and nothing else. And then what you've got will be original because, our, despite the fact there's eight billion of us, we've all got individual handwriting, we've all got individual. That it will be original by default. You don't have to try and come up with some clever idea to separate yourself from the crowd, which is what I suspect is going on in a lot of contemporary art and the art at the time, the Stuckist Manifesto, was a contrived originality rather than just your own natural originality that you have. And if I look at Van Gogh's work, I don't see someone who's who's struggling for an idea and all, all of a sudden came up with something. I just see someone who's just doing what he ha feels he has to do and by default he just happens to have made something original. And um, so yeah, so going back to what I said about Jonathan Krill, maybe I was actually completely wrong in saying that. Maybe we are actually essentially the same thing, but just manifested very differently. But essentially it is just two artists doing doing their stuff and there's no other way it can be done or said. Is that screen meant for clowns on it? Oh, it's the one down there, so it's meant the one behind. <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah, I've got two monitors. I'm getting yeah. fooled here by the high-tech layout. Yeah, I've, I've switched to two monitors now. Um, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I used to do a lot of uh, teaching poetry in schools, freelance, went around schools and performed and so on. And I told the children in the class, I said, you're, I want you to write about a thing you're a world expert on. And we're not world experts. Mm. I said, yes, you are. What did you have for breakfast this morning? What did your dad say? What did your mum say? I said, oh, this, that and the other. So you're the only person in the world that knows all that, aren't you? Yeah. So, you know, what was it like when you went to school? What did you see? You know, who did you talk to? You know, how did you get here? I mean, mm. you've got a world expert on that. And then they start trotting out, oh, yeah, and this happened and that happened. And suddenly you've got this whole uh, treasure trove of personal experience. Yeah. Um, or you can just say to someone, what was the worst thing that happened to you? What was the best thing that happened to you? And, they come out with extraordinary things, mm. and it's all there in so-called everyday life. Yeah. Um, I mean, you don't have. To, yeah, I, I totally agree with you about this striving in art for um, so-called originality. Mm. And what it comes down to is trying to find a material 
that hasn't been used for art and calling it art. Mm. So you find a shark that hasn't been done in art, so you call it art. Oh, mm. that's original. You know, you, ex you exhibit a bed like Tracy Emin exhibited her bed. Oh, no one's done that before. Well, they had actually, but never mm. mind. You know, no one's done that before. Oh, um, you make a sculpture out of bread. You make a sculpture out of your, of your, your hair, out of your own blood and freeze it. Oh, that's new, isn't it? That's new. Uh, well, it's t what's the difference between a sculpture of a head in blood mm. in a freezer and a sculpture in bronze? Oh, it's yeah. got the same contours, it communicates. Well, it's a concept, you know, but is it actually, it's not a very interesting concept, but you get it, okay, you get it, the joke or the, the mm. cleverness, bing, you know, oh, that's clever. And then once you've got it, it's like, well, it's just a sculpture. Yeah, you can spend all night just coming up with arbitrary stuff like that that has no depth to it, and it is new. You know, I'm sure no one's, you know, stuck an iron board on top of a carrot and spun it on the head of a daisy. You know, is that a genius idea because it's oh, new? It is now. Well, exactly, <laughs> that's, that's one. I mean, you, like I say, we could come up with a list of 500 by tomorrow morning. Well, and it's all just complete nonsense. Well, of course, you've taken part in the Stuckers demonstrations against the Turner Prize outside of Tate Britain several years, and mm. that was going on for about 20 years. It's stopped now because I got fed up with it. Mm. Um, I, and my, I was actually given a, a conceptual art award by the Proto Mu group for the demonstration against mm. the Turner Prize. Um, and of course, if we said it was a conceptual art piece, it would have been treated very differently. Mm. And my hope was always that it would be nominated for the Turner Prize, so our demonstration against the Turner Prize will be in the Turner Prize as one of the nominees, and simultaneously we could be outside doing a demo against... It would have to be. ...against yeah. our demo that was in there. Mm. No, that's the best. I, I think I, I made a quick video today, and I, I did say that's the best nomination I've heard. Mm. Um... Is there more than anything else that we should say about this? Perhaps just how does it relate to your other work? How does your work with Billy relate to your other work? And I have actually referred to Billy's other work, but perhaps you could say how it relates to his other work. For me, uh, these, these pretty much felt like just me doing my normal work, even though I was copying the Heckles Horse paintings. The Heckles Horse paintings uh, completely different to my work because I'm not in complete control and if if I'm not in complete control even if I really like the work in a way I, I almost really don't care it, which is it's not a I'm not being derogatory to the Hegel's horse but when I'm painting them I just don't really I, I can do whatever I want and I can just leave it for Billy to sort the problems out and that's quite freeing and then I get to kind of sit back and enjoy the the painting takes shape knowing that I've contributed to it but it's so the, the Heckles horse paintings are really the easiest things I've ever done they're just and the results are so good and so I, I think of that as just recreational really and I I get the impression there's a there's an element of that to Billy as well that he does his work over there and then he comes over and, and it's sort of like um well, I mean, there's no. It's quite, it's quite a stress-free thing anyway. Painting, and in, in, in a way, it's stress relief. But I do. I, I feel with the Heckles Horse ones, this is one where I can almost switch off and I will just go in and just do do my thing. And I, I assume something similar is true for Billy as well. Uh, perhaps his uh, other work, which goes in galleries, is more demanding in some way of discipline and control, because it is very controlled work. I, I, I don't know, I mean, in, in a way, I mean, you have to, I mean, the Heckles Horse ones, they are a discipline and control in a, in a different manifestation. I mean, you can't, it's one of those things where even though they look very loose, it, if one brushstroke is wrong, we'll change it. Yeah, but it's the difference between someone doing accounts, where every figure has to be precise, and it's like again and again and again, you know, it's... And the discipline of going down a ski slope. I don't. I don't know how Billy feels about when he's doing his own painting. It might because sometimes things can appear that they must be that way, but the experience of doing them, like I look at say Morris Escher, and I think how can he do such monotonously boring work? But obviously, from in his world, 
it might have been what it feels like for me to do a Heckel's Horse painting. Yeah, I wasn't saying that it was like doing a canvas. Oh, sorry, I but... I was just drawing a distinction between how you can have different dis different types yeah. of discipline. Obviously, going down a ski slope very fast, you need discipline. Yeah. But it's a different kind of discipline. I was, all I was just saying is different yeah. kinds of discipline. That's all sure. Right. And going down a ski slope scope is presumably for most people more enjoyable, not everybody. I mean, Paul mm. Harvey does incredibly detailed, meticulous work that would drive me bonkers. Mm. And he enjoys it, he, he thrives on it. You yeah. Know, it's, his, it's him to do that. Yeah. He finds it very, you know, therapeutic, very fulfilling. Yeah. I mean, I have to admit, I have done some, some work, at, not like Paul Harvey's at all, but where it is, it is, kind of monotonously boring but you feel compelled to, like, like I did quite a lot of pencil drawings with thousands and thousands of little dots and squares and um yeah that I have to admit that was just quite boring yeah I mean um, I've done when I was at the foundation I taught myself to do quite meticulous yeah. observational drawings and, and paintings um, mm. and it was kind of sort of a lot of it was mechanical um, yeah. And then I ended up thinking, well, why bother when you can take a photograph? Yeah. <laughs> but you can't... I mean, I say that um, a painting is like a photograph of the inner world and a photograph is a painting of the outer world. Because mm -hmm. you can't take a photograph like any of these. No. But, like I say, there will be people out there that probably find my work doing that would be mind-numbing and... You know, I, I don't know. Like you asked, like about relating to Billy's work, I I don't really know. You you really would have to ask him. I don't. No, I'm more interested in sure how it yeah. relates to your work because you're here. You're talking about it, but I just thought there might be a little gem here about you know, Billy and. Oh okay. Um. Has he said it? What what has he said about um you doing this work? Together? No, I only I only I only have done this a few days ago. Um, actually, I did no, see no, no, him it's, Monday. All your, your work together, you know, because it is. Oh, about my about my work in general. No, no, no. Your collaboration. What's he said about the work you do between you? He's well. I think both of us are are really. Um, not only us. I mean, I think we've both said they're our favourite paintings mm. of any paintings, which sounds quite big-headed to say, no, but it's the truth. I mean, I, I mean, if Picasso said he'd done something original. Yeah. Um, I think that's fairly accurate. I mean, is that being headed? I mean, that's ludicrous. It's just for, if he said, oh, well, it was nothing, it's not going to have any, it's had no effect in the world at all, that would be a load of rubbish. Exactly. You can either tell the truth or not, and if it comes across as big headed, then that's just too bad. I think so. Exactly. Well, it, so. good. We well, shouldn't come across as big headed because you don't have a choice. If you think that, you think that. Yeah. And I think Billy and I both rate the Heckles Horse paintings extremely highly. Um, yeah, we will. otherwise we wouldn't have done 200 of them, you know, mm. we wouldn't have bothered. But you said that you start them, you bash something down, excuse the word bash, mm. but you know, you create something, you put down what you feel like marks, mm. presumably you've suggested there's a dog or a figure and a house or whatever, or maybe not all of those things, but some of those things, it's not just abstract marks. No, I don't do abstract, I, paint, I always paint figurative, yeah. I never paint so abstract. You've got some kind of figurative image Always, yeah. And you said he comes along and works on it and pulls it together. Yeah, you, usually but that's does how it happens. Does it happen the other way around? Um, or do you then ever work on what his work is? Yeah, on? I do. Yeah, mo most of the time. And then does he ever work on what you've worked on and what his work on? How many times could that happen? Oh, there was one painting we did of uh, a bullfighter with the bull on top of him and we went back and forth at least five times. We ended up both painting the same painting at the same time. I think we were both at a loss, <laughs> and then we turned it round, and we 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 kind of went all over the place on that one. Um, I don't I don't think there's been another painting but did it like work that. In one. The end? Yeah, it always does. That's a, that's a good yeah. thing. We, 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 like with my paintings as well. But did you have favourite bits of the painting, and he comes along and obscures it? Does that happen? No, because I, I or don't. Or vice really... versa. Does he does he sometimes get a bit disgruntled? Oh, that was a really good mark there, and you no. decided to paint over. Not it. that he told me about. I mean, I don't because. Um, it requires a lot of tolerance on both sides. Well, I don't I don't I don't care anyway. I mean, I've I've never done a painting. 
and like with Billy and thought, I hope he doesn't touch that bit. Because the thing is, whether it's good or not is all relative to what's around it anyway. So uh, a, a good thing there is only good if everything around it. So you know it's all going to change anyway, so I don't really care what he does. And anything I do, if I really liked it, I could just try and do it on my individual. One thing I have done, I, if I've done something good, I have photographed it just so I've got that. Because I know Billy's going to come in and completely change it. But again, I, it's not nothing I really care about and there's no disgruntledness or anything. I think we're probably going towards the end of the conversation. Yeah. Does that feel like that? And um, normally at the end, you know, I think people say, ooh, how do you see it going? Where's the future? Mm. For Headless Horse Junior, I think I'm going to carry on doing more because uh, these were so easy to do and I like the results. So I've done eight, I'm going to do a ton more. Um, I'll hand for Shirley. Yeah, so just for the future is Heckles Horse Junior. I'm going to keep doing a load of Heckles Horse paintings. Heckles Horse, I don't know because we've kind of stopped. We haven't really done any in. I mean, we're talking August 2022. You go down there still. To I do still it. go down there, but we've, we've just stopped doing well, Heckles do you Horse do paintings. When you go down there? I just do my own work. Oh, I see. Um, Why? I don't know. That's It's, it's sort of like, I guess because. I don't know, it, we just haven't been doing them. So do you think Heckle's Horse has reached its end, or do you think it just needs a break to get back to it again? I really don't know. I, I mean... Ah, watch this space. Yeah. <laughs> because it's been so long. Like, we've done, like I say, in the last... It's August 2022. Covid was, what, 2020? Yeah. I think well, we've done... Let's end by blaming Covid. It's the, yes, Covid's yeah. fault, and Billy and I will get back on it um, ASAP. Okay, thank you.